Bé, bona tarda. Si us sembla, començarem ja, passem els minuts a les 7. Avui és l'últim acte del curs de la secció de filosofia, així que gràcies per venir a aquesta tarda que ja és un d'estiu i potser costa una mica més amb aquesta calor que fa. Bé, doncs com dic, avui és l'última conferència i tenim vosaltres un ponent de luxe que és el professor Ramín Cajambe Blu. Dóna la casualitat que avui parlem de la no-violència, aquesta conferència que serà, ja aviso ja que serà en anglès, el professor ha estudiat al Canadà i és professor del Canadà i no tenim traductor, però de tot aprenem molt. I com dic, parlarem de la no-violència, la conferència es diu If non-violence, a solution to the challenges of our world. Amb una pregunta, esperem que el títol surti. Doncs, dóna la casualitat que justament parlant d'aquest tema, l'any que fa 150 anys del naixement de Gandhi, així que és una altra assenyalada per parlar d'aquest tema. Ha estat una mica difícil organitzar aquesta conferència, així que agraeixo tant a l'editora d'Arcàdia, que és la seva editora, com a l'Institut Català Internacional per la Pau, que ha fet possible portar el professor Jarhan Beglus i nosaltres. I ja sense més dilació, passo a presentar-vos una mica la seva biografia i ja donem pas a la conferència. El professor Ramin Jarhan Beglus va néixer a Teheran el 1946 i és filòsof. Va estudiar Història, Ciències Polítiques i Filosofia i es va doctorar a la Sorbona de París. Va dirigir el Departament d'Estudis Contemporanis del Cultural Research Bureau de Teheran entre l'any 2002 i el 2006. Ha estat investigador a Friends Institute for Iranian Studies, al Center for Middle Eastern Studies a Harvard i a la Rajni Kotari Chair in Democracy al Center for the Study of Developing Societies a Nova Delhi. Ha estat professor també de Ciències Polítiques a la Universitat de York, de fet encara ho és, al Canadà, i a la de Toronto, i investigador del Center for Ethics d'aquesta mateixa universitat. Actualment és director del Centre Mahatma Gandhi d'Estudis per la Pau a la Jindal Global Law School de l'Índia. També una altra faceta de la seva personalitat és que és dissident del règim iranià. Ha rebut nombrosos reconeixements el 2009 aquí a casa nostra, a l'Associació per les Nacions Unides d'Espanya i ha aconseguit el 30è Premi per la Pau per la tasca de promoció del diàleg entre cultures i la defensa de la no-violència. Quan la seva producció és vastíssima, aquí només diré alguns títols. Ha escrit una vintena llarga de llibres, en persa, anglès i francès. És autor, entre d'altres obres de Conversations with Isaiah Berlin, editada en castellà per Arcadia. Gandhi, Pursuit de la non-violence, de Iran, Between Tradition and Modernity, Talking India, no sé més. Ha estat també un dels primers pensadors iranians que ha parlat de les fonts filosòfiques de la no-violència, que és cosa que vinc amb internet, i ha aprofundit en l'ideari de Mahatma Gandhi i de Martin Luther King. Entre altres llibres, també ha publicat The Gandhi and Moment, i en català, L'imperatiu intercultural i l'introducció de la no-violència, que és aquest llibret, també, força interessant, on diu sobre els problemes filosòfics de la no-violència. I, doncs, ja sense més dilació, ja li dono la paraula. Gràcies, Jordi. Estoy muy contento de estar aquí y compartir con ustedes mis opiniones sobre la no violencia en el mundo de hoy. Hablaré en inglés, pero usted puede hacer las preguntas en español. So I'm very happy to be here. Now, my subject tonight is going to be on Nonviolence, the only way to get out of the crisis. And I'm pretty sure that uh, what I have to say, uh, you will see, will end in a series of uh, interrogations coming from you. And this is the point uh, of an evening like this uh, here to make us ask uh, crucial questions actually about ourselves and about uh, the way our world is organized and managed. Uh, that is why. Uh, I'm asking this question in a very philosophical way, in a philosophical question, and it's a question about uh, the meaning of our social life, the meaning of our political life, and it's not only a, an exercise in abstract thinking, uh, which I'm thinking about. It's uh, a practical issue, actually. It's a pragmatic and practical issue. So is nonviolence a solution for the challenges, to the challenges of our world or not? In other words, uh, what is the nonviolent strategy to get out of the crisis of contemporary society? If you agree with me that we have a crisis of contemporary society, 
not only at the social and political level, but also at the moral and spiritual level, and not only in the third world, not only in the Middle East, not only in Africa, but also in Europe and also in North America. So this, I think, is very, very important to uh, ask as a question. Now, um, I would like to start by evoking the two meanings of the word crisis. And for any of us who have studied philosophy, we uh, always talk about critique, crisis, and it's important to understand what we mean exactly when we say that our contemporary society is in crisis, uh, but also it means that we are looking for a new form of consciousness and a new strategy for change. It's not that just we sit like a duck and watch uh, the crisis going on. It's also that we think about it, we try to examine it, and we try to change it. So what do we mean when we say that the contemporary society is in crisis? Uh, well, crisis has many interrelated uh, dimensions. It's uh, interleaved layers. So we talk about layers of crisis. And the crisis of contemporary society is, I think, mainly due to the excessive overplaying of the importance of material values of life. Uh, we are, we have consumer societies practically everywhere around the world today, and that's one of the problems. So we give more importance, including us sitting here in this room, we give more, and I saw it with the club actually, with the people sitting in the garden, uh, we give more importance to our material way of life rather than ethical, aesthetic, and uh, spiritual way of living. Uh, so another related dimension of contemporary uh, crisis is the increasing conformism. You know, the consumer society brings with it, has brought with it a lot of conformism, a lot of complacency, and uh, selfish individualism, what we call hedonistic individualism. And it's not a, a phenomenon of only North America and Europe. It's also a phenomenon of African societies, third world societies, Middle Eastern societies, Asian societies. They want to be like Europe and North America. Uh, so they want to become, they have this dream, I would say, the American dream or the European dream of becoming consumer societies, not to go back to the traditions and have some reflection on the world today. So we can call this, I call this actually, in many of my writings, a rise of mediocrity uh, and a rise of conformism, uh, which is very, very important, where citizens actually cease to call their social and political institutions into question. They accept what comes to them. Uh, even if, if when they go and they vote demo democratically in democratic uh, uh, countries, they still don't question it, you know. They, uh, I mean, I have, this is a problem that I have in a country like Canada, which is a very peaceful country in comparison with uh, wild violence going on everywhere else. People are very conformist and complacent, you know. They don't want much of a change in their society. They prefer that everything is very, very smooth because this is the way we want to live in today's world. So as a result, the entire educational process of the individual, especially in our societies, finds itself uh, void of two central questions. And these are very key questions which are asked by philosophers, actually. How are we living together? How are we living together? What does it mean when we say we are living together? And what are we living together for? What is the aim of us gathering here? What is the aim of you guys coming here and listening to me? You know, I'm not giving you slogans. You know, sometimes my wife sitting here tells me if you give slogans. I'm not giving slogans. This is a actually deep reflection, and I'm inviting you to have a deep reflection. Uh, so, by what well, we have to ask, why are we living together? Why we assemble somewhere to have to listen to philosophy, to practice philosophy, to practice thinking, uh, and to ask questions? In other words, what I'm asking. How can people think civically and act democratically in time of crisis? And I will come back to the Catalan problem later on. Uh, as you know, I write for ARA, and I think that the question of the independence of Catalonia is a philosophical question, not only a political question. I know that some of you are going to be embraced by that, 
Uh, but I will put it as a challenge because uh, this will, you will come back maybe with some question. So let us come back for a moment and analyze this concept of crisis. Uh, we have an everyday tendency to use the term crisis. Our politicians all the time on TV, they're talking about crisis. Uh, crisis of this, crisis of that, you know, and so uh, it's a colloquial fashion to connote the idea of uncontrolled danger. When we say crisis, we say, oh, uncontrolled danger. And, but the word, the word crisis, uh, it gives us a possibility of a meaningful change. Why? Because you know, crisis actually, and uh, those of you who have studied philosophy, comes from the Greek word krinein. And from the same roots, we have the word kritik and criticism, uh, which is important. So krinein in Greek, ancient Greek, means to decide to distinguish, to separate, you know? Uh, how do we decide? How do we separate? How do we distinguish? What do we distinguish? We distinguish between what is correct and what is not correct. We distinguish between what is just and what is not just. We distinguish, as the German philosopher Kant used to say, between quid facti and quid jury, jury uh, in Latin. So uh, once there is a moment of crisis, which is not only a moment of threat and failure, but also an ability to provide treatments for a better future. So when we say crisis, it's not that we are in danger, we cannot do anything. It means that we are in a moment of change also, that we have to meet with change, and we have to think about how we can bring change, okay? So this is the whole point that I'm gonna make about nonviolence. Therefore, we're talking about a moment of rupture, we're talking about radical transformation, we're talking about the turning point and an opportunity for alternative initiatives. And when properly understood, crisis would mean being at crossroads, being at a crossroads, okay? Yeah. Meaning having new commitments, having new responsibilities. And this is the whole point that I want to make tonight. So it's experiencing uh, the possibility of a break, of a rupture, okay? Una ruptura, uh, how, how you can have this rupture, how you can have this transformation. And this is where nonviolence comes in. Because nonviolence has always been a strategy of rupture, a strategy of change, uh, a strategy of transform transformation, a self transformation, a community transformation. Get it? We can talk about it in, with Gandhi, we can talk about it with Tolstoy, we can talk about it with Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we can talk about it. it. They all believe in a self-transformative and community transformative energy and change. So this, uh, it, this is why nonviolence is as old as humanity. Uh, you know, it has, it has always been in our history. And each time that humanity was hurt, and humiliated by violence uh, centuries, we always had an, the alternative of people coming and talking about nonviolence. Now, maybe they didn't mention the word nonviolence, but they could mention the word love, like Jesus Christ, or the Buddha, uh, or in Jainism, uh, or they can talk about um, non-harming, you know? Uh, but uh, anyway, it would, it had the same feeling that they were talking about uh, nonviolence. So it is impossible to define nonviolence without first of all specifying what is meant by violence. What do we mean when we say uh, we, they, they, they practice violence against us? Yeah? Is it only uh, the police coming and beating the independence Catalans in the streets of Barcelona? Is that only the only violence? No. This is one form of violence that we have. Is it the Le Gilets Jaunes in Paris uh, or the, uh, the people breaking the windows? Uh, that's also one form of violence. Uh, but uh, I think that violence goes beyond only murder and the strength of nature. It can be natural violence. We talk about fire in the forest. We talk about hurricanes. We talk about tsunamis. Uh, we talk about avalanches, we talk about even death. So uh, these are all forms of violence, you know, uh, for violence against nature, nature against human beings. So violence is the will 
when is, we talk in the sense that, for example, religions, Bible, New Testament, uh, other religions, it's always the will to dominate the other. When we say violence, we mean the will to dominate the other. Violence, if you are familiar with the work of uh, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, this Jewish uh, French philosopher who has worked a lot on uh, the Torah, uh, Bible, uh, what he says very correctly is that in the Bible, when we say, we talk about violence, when the Bible talks about violence, the Jew, I mean, the, in Hebrew, they meant in Hebrew making the other silent. Being violent against one other person is to make that person silent. So no speech, lack of discourse, end of discourse, no, no talking and no speech talking. And so the end of freedom of expression, what we call today with human rights, the end of human freedom of expression. You cannot express yourself anymore. Violence is when uh, you cannot express uh, anymore. So um, this is where we started uh, having um, antonyms for nonviolence. Uh, we used uh, peace, we talked about love, we talked about civilization, we talked about democracy, depending on different centuries. Uh, for us, where there was no violent, political violence, we called it democracy. Where there was no barba bar barbarism, we called it civilization. Where there was no inter-individual, inter-subjective violence, we called it love, for example. But the term nonviolence itself, it appeared in 20th century. And uh, since its birth, this term has struggled for its existence and recognition. And the key player for this struggle was Mahatma Gandhi, of course, uh, because he provided the world with a new method, with a new theory, uh, with a new vocabulary that included the word, non the word nonviolence. Actually, he took the word ahimsa, which means literally absence of desire to harm and kill, and he translated it into English and it became nonviolence. So, but something is missing because from going from Ahimsa, which was practiced by Jainism, by Buddhism, by Hinduism, and bring it in another context, something it was missing. Uh, Gandhi actually inherited this theory, uh, but he also added something more to it. So he didn't stay only at the level of the Buddha, Buddhist uh, philosophy or the uh, Hindu philosophy. He made it an anti-colonial struggle. And nonviolence became with Gandhi an anti-colonial struggle, not just uh, not harming the animals, being a vegetarian, not harming, uh, or not thinking about violence uh, towards the other person as uh, Buddhism talks about. Uh, it's not only refusal to hurt and kill, it's not only about self-purification, because some of you who might be familiar or practice Buddhism, you know that uh, when you talk about nonviolence in Buddhism, it's also a form of self-purification. You should not think about the other person violently. Uh, but with Gandhi, it's more than that. It becomes political, it becomes social, it becomes anthropological. Uh, so he added the political dimension to the concept of ahimsa. And talking about nonviolence, and it became the center of his struggles in South Africa and also in India. So how did it, uh, how did it work, which if we, are, we inherited that? Actually, uh, nonviolence started to imply mass struggles, uh, mass demonstrations, uh, techniques of uh, fighting against imperialism, colonialism, political domination, with what? With strikes, with marching, with uh, uh, hunger striking, with acts of non-cooperation, and many more. And this, we have been practicing it for over 100 years. We have been practicing it uh, practically in every civilization, every society. You had it in Latin America, you had it in Europe, you had it in North America with Martin Luther King, you had it with Mandela and the South Africans, uh, you had it practically everywhere. In the Middle East, you had it with the Arab Spring. Uh, practically everywhere, it has been practiced as techniques of fighting against domination. You had it even in Catalonia. That's my point, actually. Uh, when I say that Catalonia has its Gandhi moment, it means that it has been practicing that, and we will come to that later on. Now, Gandhi actually added 
three points in his philosophy to this nonviolence. He called it Satyagraha, he called it Swaraj, and he called it Sarvadoya. Two, three actually aspects which become important. Satyagraha is what Gandhi asks, calls the soul force, the force of the soul, which is grabbing, grasping truth, uh, word by word. Swaraj means self-rule. We call it in our modern philosophy, modern political philosophy that he's going to study at Warwick, is we call it autonomy today. The Europeans call it autonomy. All these philosophers who have been writing for the past 50 years on autonomy is actually autonomy, both morally and politically means self-rule. How you give yourself the regulations, okay? Either at the level of the law, moral law, or political law. But you will not accept somebody else dictating to you your own laws. And Savadoya means welfare of all. So uh, what Gandhi, Gandhian nonviolence is all about is the ability to self-rule, which is accompanied with the conviction that the individual good cannot be distinguished from the good of the others. When we are talking about the good of the individual, we have to think about the good of the others. And Gandhi was very much influenced by John Ruskin, who is an anti-utilitarian British philosopher. John Ruskin is well known for his, uh, uh, for his writings on art, like Turner and architecture, Gothic architecture and other things. But he wrote one famous book, Unto This Last, which Gandhi read and translated, and he was very much influenced. And it's anti-utilitarian. It's, well, it's written against John Stuart Mill and Bentham and the utilitarians. And the point is, it's very social democratic in a Scandinavian way, is that you, when you're thinking about your own individualism, you have to think about the individuality of the others. You have to think in terms of what we call in philosophy intersubjectivity. So this is how nonviolence uh, came out with Gandhi and became very, very important. Now, there, was, there is a problem, and I'm sure that you will come back with your questions on that, uh, many people, they think of nonviolence, especially po people engaged in uh, politics, in, in political militantism and partisanship. They think it's very too passive. Is you, you cannot change things. You know, Marxists used to think like that. Revolutionaries like to think like that. You know, uh, you cannot do anything because nonviolence is too passive, is non-resistance. That's not true. Uh, even Christian pacifism actually uh, thought like that, okay? is we are only pacifists, we don't go to war if we are a Quaker or we are a Mennonite. Uh, but nonviolence is more than that. Nonviolence is not only passive, it's a very active, actually, uh, philosophy, and even uh, religious nonviolence is very active. Because, <clears throat> and here, we need to distinguish with Gene Sharp, another theorist, theorist of nonviolence, between what he called principled nonviolence and pragmatic nonviolence. Principled nonviolence is when we talk about philosophical and religious foundations of nonviolence. For example, we say Dalai Lama, as a Buddhist, is a nonviolent uh, activist. Okay? He believes in nonviolence. But he believes in nonviolence because he's a Buddhist. Okay? Or Gandhi, as, as somebody who was principled, he believed in that. Now, uh, you have somebody like uh, Bobby Sands, the IRA. Uh, revolutionary who died during Margaret Thatcher in prison because of his hunger strike. He was not, he didn't have a philosophy of nonviolence like a Buddhist or a Jain or a Hindu uh, or like Martin Luther, like a Christian. Uh, he, he, but he used it as a method to uh, actually fight against uh, the British government and to fight against Margaret Thatcher. And of course he died because of his uh, hunger strike. But you see there are differences between techniques of nonviolence and philosophy of nonviolence. Um, Gene Sharp, which I invite you to go and read him, he calls it a moral jujutsu. You know, do you, does anybody practice here martial arts uh, or has done it in the, when you were younger? Uh, karate, kung fu, you know, uh, uh, judo. Uh, jujutsu actually, uh, political jujutsu, which I hope you're gonna practice in Catalonia also, is a, a technique to use to, over, to throw the opponent, you take the energy of the opponent and you throw off the balance the opponent. But when you're practicing that in a non-violence non uh, politically, you're throwing off balance politically. 
you're not doing it actually with your gestures, you're doing it politically, meaning that you are superior to your enemy, uh, like Mandela with the apartheid regime. You know, Mandela actually go off balance the apartheid regime, but he did it with what? He did it with nonviolence, he did it with reconciliation. Because he knew that the arm, the weapon of reconciliation is definitely for racist uh, whites of South Africa. Uh, they, they will die immediately, okay? So, and that's what happened, because they could not continue having apartheid regime while they wanted to give democracy to the blacks. Uh, so they had to change themselves. Again, the question of self-transformation. So we have here an active process of bringing political, economic, social, and emotional pressure uh, to make changes, actually, uh, to the others. And this is where I think things become uh, very, very important. Now let's come to serious matters. And this is uh, the point that I wanted to make because we said how can we change our world. Now, since we are living in, uh, in a democracy, uh, so-called European democracies, and in North America we have North American democracies, how does this work in democracy? Uh, what is it important? How can we talk about the process of democratic transition in relation with uh, nonviolence? What is what is important in the non relation between nonviolence and democracy? Well, I think that the element which is the most important in a democracy is not the state, is the civil society. Uh, the, what makes democracies democratic, democratic are civic actors, not necessarily politicians for whom we vote in the European Parliament or in our countries. Uh, because politicians, they never want to give you democracy. They are forced to give you democracy. You force them to be democratic. Otherwise, they will not. Uh, most of them are very corrupted people, actually. And if they can rob you, if, I, if they can steal your pocket, they will steal your pocket. This is the order of politics actually in today's world. It's all about money and all about power. Uh, but if democracy is not supposed to be about money and about power, how can we deepen this democratic process through nonviolence? What does democratic governance has to do with nonviolence? Well, I think that democratic governance uh, requires an adaptation to the norms and pro procedures of democratic conflict reg regulation. We need to know how to enter a conflict in a democracy, and this is where nonviolent process of change becomes very, very important. So the more a democratic community develops instruments of nonviolence, the more resistant it is to uh, political windstorms, to crisis, and it can get out of, uh, prepare its own uh, transformation. As you can see, since I criticize consumerist society and conformism and complacency, and I will add conservatism to it, I always call it the three C's, uh, uh, actually. Uh, politics of nonviolence is for me, and for people who have been practicing nonviolence and writing about nonviolence, it's a much more valuable safeguard of democracy than the free market. Uh, because capitalism says to us, if we don't have free market, we don't have democracy. I would say if we don't have nonviolence, we don't have democracy. We can put aside free market, but have democracy without free market necessarily. It doesn't mean that I'm for a state-oriented economy, but nonviolence is much more important than uh, the, to have the free market. Also, the question that we need to ask in relation with democracy is why does democracy matter? And is it worth our efforts? Is it worth fighting for democracy? Or is it only as Benjamin Constant, uh, the French uh, 19th century uh, political philosopher and politician used to say, is it only the satisfaction of our desire? When we are living in a democracy, are, are we only living for to satisfy our desires in our private spheres? No. Because democracy is not about the private sphere, it's about the public sphere. Democracy cannot be democratic without the public sphere. If it was only about the private sphere, we would be private citizens. And we cannot define public citizens, and we cannot define ourselves as a private. So democracy would not have a meaning, because democracy from the Athenian, Athenian times of Socrates and Plato until today has always been about agora, ecclesia, 
public space, citizen in the public space, agency and political and social agency in the public space. So it's very important to understand where we're coming from. And here I think that nonviolence can be an attitude, a political attitude, it can be a moral vision, uh, it can be a moral stance in life. And here, nonviolence is actually facing, contradicting, criticizing mediocrity, minority, pettiness, uh, and of course, uh, violence at all levels of our social life. And that's very, very important. So in democracy, we need to make a moral choice. We only make political choices at the level of our voting, but we don't make moral choices. And we need to make moral choices because moral choice is the middle ground between certainty and doubt. Uh, we cannot have full doubt of democracy, otherwise we throw it in the, in the river. And we cannot have certainty, 100% certainty, because otherwise we become as stupid as those people who go and vote for Donald Trump. Without thinking about democracy, they say, well, if uh, I vote for my Donald Trump because he says what is on my mind and I, I'm not saying it myself and he's, he will say it instead of me. But this is not the principle of democracy. This is the principle of stupidity. And we call it this principle of stupidity, not of democracy, you know? That you let somebody else talk instead of you and say what you have on your mind. You have to say it yourself and practice it yourself. So there is a commitment when we talk about uh, uh, democracy and nonviolence, and it's a possibility. It's a human possibility, human morality. Here, what becomes more important, and I try to be very quick on that, is how to get to a level of solidarity of human family. How do we get to the what Martin Luther King Jr. called a companionship? Uh, 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 how do we get to the solidarity? How do we interconnectedness? Now, we have to think that this democratic approach is not only in the relationship between us citizens, it's also our relationship with the planet and nature. This is, we have to have a non-dominant relationship with nature, with animals, with plants, with oceans, seas, uh, with the skies, not to pollute the sky. This is how you have a moral democratic relationship with nature also. It's not only at the level of the, um, of, of the citizens. So I'm talking about the dialogical exchange, which is important inside a political society, but outside a political society also with the environment around us, which becomes important. And here, I think what nonviolence brings in is the limit and the level of our responsibilities. How much we are responsible towards the way we are living together. Why, uh, why should we be, be responsible? Why should we teach our children to be responsible? We don't teach them to be responsible. We, we send them to school, private or public school, but we don't teach them to be responsible. We teach them how to grow and become consumerist. We teach them how to feel that they are jobless or they have to fight to find a job. They study to have jobs. They don't study to become wise. And the problem today is that education, the goal of education is to tame violence, which is not the case actually. And the goal of education is that to become wiser, to become a, a Socratic self-examination of yourself. So it, this is a very, very important point. So what I'm saying, uh, to make it short, is that when we talk about democracy, uh, like in Spain, for example, we t always talk about the electoral rule of majority. One party wins against other parties, and we, there is a majoritarian uh, democracy. But this is not what we're talking about. We're talking, in the Gandhian sense, about shared sovereignty. Shared sovereignty. If there is a sovereignty, we have to, it has to be shared is in a Gandhian sense, actually, because democratic governance, and I want you to pay good attention to what I'm saying, democratic governance is not about power over the society, is the power within it, okay? This is the difference. In a Hobbesian way, you have a power over the society, meaning politicians, when they get into a state, they have power over us with the institutions and the laws, but we're talking here from the power within. 
So it comes from the bottom, actually. Bottom, it goes bottom up. And if this is the case, democracy and nonviolence are will be inseparable. The, why? Because it's not only about institutional guarantees, uh, it's also about new perspectives of democratization. So the question that I'm asking, which is an important question, which is actually the Catalan problem also, how do we democratize democracies? Why do we think that we have to sit on, uh, we have to sit and to think that if we have a democracy like a Spanish democracy or a French democracy or a German democracy, this democracy it should not change at all. Why should democracies not change? Democracies have to change. And what is the way of changing democracies? Is to democratize democracies. But how can you democratize democracies? Or do you, can you democratize democracy only with the free market? No, you cannot do that. So democ democracies in democracies act is actually when, by, by nonviolence approach, is actually when you uh, go and you attack the essence of the meaning of democracy itself, and you have public agency, you have political agency of the citizens, and this is how uh, it's not about living comfort comfortably, uh, but it's, uh, we give meaning about our common life, how, how we are living together and how we want uh, to make changes. So if I have to uh, uh, make it short and go to my conclusion, uh, is uh, what I'm saying is that nonviolence actually is a never ending process. Uh, it's not only about only taming violence in a society, it's also from one generation to another is to ask the real question, philosophical question about why and how are we living together and how we can change this uh, living together. So I think the a real crisis that I started with uh, as a question uh, has nothing to do with only economic crisis or financial crisis, but it is a spiritual crisis in our today's world. Uh, everywhere, practically, we have a spiritual uh, crisis. And the crisis, spiritual crisis is because we have lost this meaning of life and political life and social life. Uh, the and uh, this is the, where the limits of our nonviolent strategy can help us somehow to get back to this level of interconnectedness that we have lost and somehow uh, help us to exercise beyond coercive power, exercise our rights of citizens, and sometimes even uh, disobey laws. Uh, now, I want to make uh, just a point which uh, I think is important in nonviolence we have the power of disobedience. We need to have this obligation not only to obey, but also the obligation to disobey, okay? To disobey also, not only to obey, but also to disobey. You know, when we're talking about obedience uh, in, uh, in politics, actually, uh, we, I get uh, the word, um, the French word, obéir, uh, which comes from uh, ob, ob Odire, which means uh, uh, listening, okay, and accepting to listen. Sometimes we should uh, disobey, meaning that we have to, though we are listening, we have to learn also to change. Now, disobedience is very, very important because unjust laws have to be disobeyed. In this, at the same level that we need to obey good laws, and laws, when I say good laws, it means not the laws which are given to us only by the state, but the laws in the which we are at the foundation of it, constitutionally, democratically, and we understand it. We need to disobey uh, unjust laws. Because, and this is a, we need to do it in a nonviolent ways. If we want to be citizens of a democracy and we want to democratize democracies, we need to be able to disobey and ex uh, uh, unjust laws and to exercise uh, our rights. So to end, I think this is all about, and then what I wanted to share with you uh, to this evening, is all about transforming uh, the social power of citizens uh, and to make this work to benefit uh, nonviolent principles. And this requires a highest degree of self-transformation, self-confidence, self-discipline, 
self-realization, all these aspects that Gandhi talked about, which are very, very important. Uh, and without this, actually, citizens uh, cannot re-educate themselves. They cannot promote a culture of nonviolence. They cannot uh, encourage an ethics of empathy, uh, as I call it. Uh, they cannot practice solidarity uh, among human beings. Uh, and it will remain, nonviolence will remain a, a void concept a sen with no sense of reality. We need this sense of reality. Uh, so I'm convinced that we will never be able to democratize our liberal democracy based on the rule of law if we do not at the same time build a society that is more ethical, uh, more humane, more meaningful, and which brings me to my uh, last word, uh, which is nonviolence, according to me, is our passport to the future. And for tomorrow, I think that nonviolence is what we can call the moral grandeur, moral grandeur of democratic uh, civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Yes, I try to finish on time. Please have the courage to ask questions. No, everything that I said is com comprehensive. If you don't ask questions, I have to defy you on the Catalan problem. Ah, you know? See, I'm glad if you don't understand, I ask him, yes. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, not, not necessary. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. I think that when you're talking about culture, um, uh, even in Africa or in Catalonia or anywhere else, you know, um, human culture has many aspects because uh, any culture, like for example, uh, Let's talk about Middle East today. Islam is a good example. Uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism. In every culture, you might have some violent aspects. Uh, for example, in, in many of our religions, especially Abrahamic religions, we have had uh, violent institutions like Inquisition, you know, in the Spanish in uh, Inquisition. We had. Uh, uh, we had the Italian Inquisition, uh, which uh, killed people like uh, Giordano Bruno or uh, put on in, uh, in trial uh, Galileo. Uh, so, and this is part of the culture also. So, 
we have to make, uh, once again, we have, this is the critique, the crine, we have to separate, we have to distinguish between which elements of a, one, of a human culture or of a native culture has nonviolent elements and helps us to tame the violence of the citizens or the violence of the state, and how much of it uh, we have to transform uh, or criticize or go beyond it. Otherwise, we would have been stuck in Europe with uh, the Christian Inquisition. I mean, if we didn't have the Enlightenment, if we didn't have the philosophers of the 18th, 19th century, if we didn't have all these uh, social movements, uh, we would be discussed uh, again with the Christian the Inquisition. So the fact that we could make the separation between the two by saying, and I'm not a French, like, I don't believe in French laicity, I believe in Indian secularism, meaning I don't want to throw out religious people out of the public sphere by saying that you are, because you're religious, because you're a religious party, you cannot participate uh, fully. No, that's, again, this very anti-democratic. I think that religious people have a right to be in a public sphere, but they have no right to practice any form of violence, either in their private sphere or in their public sphere. Uh, meaning, if a woman doesn't want to have the veil, you cannot force that woman to have a veil in the name of Islam. Uh, especially when you're living in European countries. Uh, but you can be a Muslim minister. You can say, I go, I'm a minister of the French, uh, I'm a French minister of justice or a French minister of sports. But on Fridays, I go and pray in my mosque. Okay, no problem. You go, Christians go to the church and, uh, in, in other, uh, and the Hindus go to the temple. That's not a problem. So, I think we have to distinguish how much uh, of this uh, culture that you were talking about, and it, it also concerns Catalonia, how much it can offer to democratize democracies, you know? Uh, actually, let me tell you very bluntly, since I am now in Catalonia, that I believe that the Catalan problem is not only a problem of language and culture, it's also a problem of democracy and democratizing democracy. This is what the Spanish state doesn't understand. It's like in Scotland, and it's like in Ireland. It's about democratizing Spanish democracy. It's making it better, because uh, people become more humane, become more humanistic, become more moral when they understand that some people are asking for their freedom or independence. It's not only about political independence. It's also a form of enlightenment. It's also a form of getting out of our minority. It's also Thinking widely, I would say it's the second step after exit from Frankism. You know, the exit of Spain from Franco's time. Second exit is exit for the independence of Catalonia. Why? Because it's not only about Catalans separating themselves from others. Not only about it's about Spain becoming more democratic. Meaning, as I said, I believe that where you have unjust laws, we cannot come up like the apartheid regime and say, you know, it's written in our constitution, so you cannot do anything with it. The hell with the constitution. What does it mean? Constitution is not a God's actually law. It's a human law. You can change human laws, but you have to do it democratically. Sometimes you take weapons and you want to kill people, you cannot do that. But sometimes you want to have a dialogue on the nature of the laws. Socrates had that, Plato had that, Aristotle had that. In every century we had that, didn't we? Uh, the way that we could get out of the Inquisition was partly also not without violence, but we did it with philosophy and with dialogue and with culture. So I think that it's very important where we're standing and how we are arguing about things. Uh, culture per se cannot be an exit door we have to see what are the elements which make a culture, and what are the humanistic elements, what are actually the violent elements. We have to get rid of these violent elements that we have in our cultures. Capitalism, capitalism is a form of culture, you know? Capitalism way of living, it, it's very violent, you know? Very, very violent. We have to understand that we have to have a critique of capitalism when it is actually very anti-human, when it is actually very anti-planetarian, when capitalism and technology says, I want to have full mastering of nature, 
and I would eat everything which comes from the sea. I would destroy all the plants. I would uh, make pollute all the air. You say, no, basta. Morally basta, you know. I, I'm not with you at all. You have to stop thinking in terms of money, Mr. Trump. Okay? You do not develop all the time and be a developer of real estate. You have to think, okay, stop. It's enough. We want to keep our... Uh, 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 green spaces. We don't want our parks to become, uh, you know, uh, the HLM, as we say in French, meaning the having habitation, uh, you know, uh, two towers. Uh, so it's, it's always thinking in these terms. You know, our businessmen, for example, they have to think in these terms also. The business of culture, the business of architecture, the, the how we are thinking uh, in terms of this interconnectedness. I love the term that is used by Martin Luther King Jr., he calls it the cosmic companionship. Cosmic companionship. So cosmic companionship is not only a friendship that I would might have with you as citizens, as people, my audience, but cosmic means with the world. As I said, with plants, animals, with the air, everything with the oceans, you know. I'm not, when I go on the ocean, I'm not supposed to throw my plastic bag in the ocean. I have to respect the ocean. But how can I respect that if I don't have epistemic humility? If I think that my science is more dominating and is a good science, so I can do anything I can do with my test tube and with my laboratory. This is not going to work. At some point, we have to say, no, it cannot work that, and it's important. Did I answer your question? OK, good. <laughs> Yes, good. Yes, yes. No, why? Why? You have an article now? Yes, I don't have even an, uh, only an article. I have a book in Catalan which is called uh, in Spanish La Hora Gandhi, but it's also Laura Gandhi or something like that in Catalan. It's in Galaxy Gutenberg. It's in Catalan also. Uh, so you can go and read that. It's called The Gandhi Moment. Yes. I mean, the book is in, uh, I published in English with Harvard Press many years ago in 2013. It's called The Gandhi Moment. And in that, I'm referring also to the Arab Spring. The Gandhi moment is now uh, not only a moment only to India. It's a moment which actually has been reproducing itself around the globe for the past 100 years, and especially uh, 70 years after the death of Gandhi. Meaning uh, we had it in, uh, in America with Martin Luther King. We had it in uh, South Africa with Mandela. We had it with Aung San Suu Kyi in uh, Myanmar. We had it. Uh, we ha we had had it in uh, Chile and Argentina with the referendum there. So the Gandhi moment of Catalonia is this agency that I think that the Catalans have, even if they are unionists, even if they are unionists, because it's not only about the independence. It's about the dialogue which happens among Catalans about how to democratize their democracy. Okay, and this is the element which is important. So what makes me furious is that when you come out and you want to have a dialogue, you have policemen which beat you up, like in May 68 of France. This is unacceptable. The, the violence coming from the Spanish police is unacceptable. Any kind of violence coming from any police in America, in France, in Spain, in Catalonia is unacceptable because you're talking about the rights of men, rights of human beings. You're talking about the right of freedom of expression. But more than that, you're talking about a dialogue, political dialogue, social dialogue, moral dialogue, that you want to engage with the others. So if the other is not mature to accept the dialogue in a Socratic way, the fault is not because of you. The fault is because of that people, which are not mature enough to accept dialogue. You know, you know, we have too much confidence in our states around the world. The states and statesmen are stupid people. They are immoral people. 
Why do we think that every politician has to be uh, very intelligent with a high IQ? It's not the case at all in today's world. Around Europe, you have Marine Le Pen, low IQ. Uh, you have uh, Donald Trump, low, I low IQ. You have Orban in Hungary, low IQ. Uh, who are the people with high IQs? You, high IQs are actually people standing outside politics in today's world. Uh, to tell you the truth, are the artists, the creators, philosophers, writers, uh, some uh, civic actors. So the, 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 the Ghanaian moment of Catalonia is the moment where Catalonia starts having self-transformation, but also engaging a dialogue with itself and with outside world, which is very, very important. Yes. Yes, yeah, Peloponnesian War. Yeah. Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I'm not as pessimistic as you are because, uh, yeah, but the fact is that the um, apartheid regime was a fact issue and people thought that no, the world is not going to come out and uh, have a dialogue with the Mandela, uh, but they had a dialogue with Mandela because Mandela came up, came out actually as a better politician as person with uh, self-transforming principles, uh, he talked about uh, reconciliation, and even the business world, which thought that, okay, we want to do business with South Africa, Mandela is a better president than Peter Botha, because Peter Botha, with his violence and uh, uh, beating up the, and um, killing the blacks, uh, at some point is not gonna help us at all. Uh, this is what I uh, tell the Iranians, you know, Iranian uh, Islamic Republic, which doesn't want to have a dialogue with the world and wants to violate human rights all the time, they're going to die. You know, as simple as that. We say this is the law of history. You cannot remain a tyrant. Caligula is a good example, and Nero is a good example. You cannot remain a tyrant all your life, you know, because people are going to fight back. Uh, we have it in Africa also. They're going to fight back. And you yourself, you will going to self-destruct because tyrants actually have this capacity, as Camus shows it very well, they have this capacity of self-destructing themselves. So I think that in the case of Catalonia also, uh, we, in, I do the comparison with uh, Athens and the ancient Greece. The, ancient, the hero of the ancient Greece is Socrates, you know, it's not only Pericles, it's also Socrates. And Socrates is a man of dialogue. He dies, yes, but he leaves for us the self-examination. How can we have democracy and define democracy without self-examination? If democracy is much better than the, as church is uh, better than the other forms of government and uh, political regimes, it's because it's a self-examining regime, which tyrannies are not. Because the virtue in a, of democracy is to self-examine itself. Now, the Catalan problem is a self-examination of the Spanish state. It's not only about Catalans. This is what Mr. Rajoy and Sanchez don't understand because they think that 
Catalan problem is only Catalan problem. No, it is a self-examination of Spain and Europe, as Scotland and Ireland are also. It's not only a, a, a British problem and or a Scottish problem. It's a problem of Europe. And it's not only the problem of Europe, it's a problem of the world. It's a global problem. Because uh, like Mandela was a big human problem, planetarian problem, because what um, the success of Mandela on nonviolence in South Africa helped the other African countries to think not in terms of Idi Amin Dada, but in terms of Mandela as, as a leadership. Which leader should you choose when you have somebody like Mandela? Do you choose Idi Amin Dada or you choose Mandela? Of course you choose Mandela. I mean, anybody who is sane in his brain or her brain and is a little bit wise would choose, of course, Mandela because there is no future with Idi Amin Dada or uh, dictators in Africa, you know? Uh, there's no way you can get out of it. So once again, it's about how we form ourselves as citizens, how we think, what is our agency, what we have to think about. It's not sitting at our how homes in Barcelona and say, okay, independence is gonna come. No, independence is not gonna come. You have to think about it, and you have to think what is the best way of doing it. You have to have a, a, a political creativity, political creation, you know? Making democracy and democratizing democracy is a political creativity, like an artist making a painting. You have to bring all your reflection in it and to make this change. Otherwise, the change will not come, okay? or step by step, dialogue step by step. Bé, hauríem d'anar acabant, si hi ha una pregunta molt curta, si us veu que no hi ha. Yes. Yes, <laughs> because you have you make a mistake also. I mean, the mistake that you make is that your Spain is a state-oriented Spain, and is a, as I said, is a Spain where it comes to power from above and not from power within. It's not the Spain of Pablo Picasso. It's not the Spain of Albeniz and De Falla. It's not the Spain of Lorca. Uh, this your Spain is only the Spain of Inquisition and uh, Franco. So it's only the Spain of uh, violence. Is a state. Is a Spain which is always ordering from top to the bottom. But this is not the societies don't work with like this. You know, some societies uh, have more capacity than others. Uh, to provide all this agency from within and from below. And this is how you have in an apartheid somebody like Mandela and in the British colonialism somebody like Gandhi. How does it, where does it come from? Where, where does Gandhi come from with British colonialism? It's Gandhi because Gandhi is not the product only of British colonialism. He's a product of India, of Indian culture. 
of Hinduism, of Buddhism. Now, in, in Catalonia in, and also in Spain, you have elements of democ democracy, you have elements of nonviolence in your culture, but you have to go and find it and work with it. Every culture you have to go and find with it. If you come from an Islamic culture, it's a stupidity to say that Islam can never be nonviolent. No, that's not true because there has been many people working with Gandhi who were Muslims. And where did they get that? They believed in Islam, but they knew how to have their own interpretation of the Quran. Like the Christians, instead of going to the, towards Vatican, they went towards Jesus Christ and Sermon on the Mount. And they said, we don't want to follow Vatican. We will follow like St. Francis, OK? or like uh, Saint, uh, uh, Saint Jean de la Croix, or like uh, Teresa Davila, or other mystics, Meister Eckhart, uh, Jacob Böhme, and you have others in the 20th century. They said, we follow the message of Jesus Christ. We're not going to follow the message of Vatican. Now, in Spain, it's the same thing. If you want to follow the message of Franco, Rajoy, Sanchez, or even Podemos and others, uh, Ciudadanos, this is not going to work. Uh, Spain is a country of Don Quixote and Cervantes. It's, it's the country of, is for me, is a country, I've worked on Ortega y Gasset. It's a country of Ortega y Gasset. It's a country of Unamuno. It's a country of Pablo Picasso. It's a country, as I said, of all these great minds. Now, these great minds are not only the great minds of the past, they are great minds of the present. We have to go and read them, listen to them, and uh, see what they will have to say, and work with them. This is where I think that they're in every culture that, because there is no black and white. In every culture, you have gray zones. And these gray zones are gray zones of culture, art, and creativity, which has always been useful for us not only as artists and intellectuals, but as ordinary citizens, to use them to democratize uh, our uh, political systems. This is the, that's why we, we read books, okay? Otherwise, you go and you don't read books, go to, it's Fahrenheit 451, go and burn the books. We read books, why do we read books? Because with reading books, we change our society, we change our life. Why do we go to exhibitions and we watch Picasso, Guernica, why do we, uh, listen to Ludwig van Beethoven and Gustav Mahler because this has a sense of meaning for us as human beings. It's about our passion, about our sympathy, about our change that we want to have in our lives. Otherwise, we are not actually meaningful human beings. That's the point. I think in the long term, yes. Of course. No, maybe not in the... Yeah, maybe the judgment. I cannot change the judgment. Yes. Yes, but... Uh, no, we are not living only in a short period of time, actually. When we are judging uh, evolution of societies, we have to judge the evolution of societies in long term. Maybe the judgment is going to be very negative for uh, Catalonia, most probably very negative, okay? But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that the story is finished, okay? It's not the end of the story. That's the, pro that's the issue. When it's not the end of the story, you always continue having your agency and trying to change things. Why do you think that with one judgment, you have to go and sleep at home? Why? The struggle continues. But the struggle is not in the manner of Che Guevara. You don't need to have only Che Guevara's and have to go in the jungle and take a weapon. You have long-term philosophical, artistic, uh, citizen struggle. And in many, many countries, it happens like this. You know, In many, many countries, you know, the, the resistance let me give you one example. In countries like Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the, the struggle, the most important struggle in the past 40 years was, has been done by women. But women, how? Because instead of putting their veil here, they put it here. And this is a way of struggling. So this is a form of civic struggle. And at the end of the day, I will tell you, the Islamics are going to leave.
because they cannot tolerate. Uh, the, how many generations of Islamists can accept that you put your veil from here? And how many husbands and, and uh, fathers and brothers can violate your human rights uh, as women and uh, the society would accept? They will, there's a point they will not accept. You know, they will not accept. So this is the form of struggle I'm talking about. I'm not talking about immediate. You might not have immediate results. And most of the time, we don't have immediate results in any dimension of life. We have to put a lot of efforts, even in our friendship, even in our family life. We have to put a lot of... Uh, we might not be able to do it. Again, and this is a conversation I have with my wife. We, we all have our weaknesses. We might not succeed to do it. At, but we might succeed at some level. We might fail at other level. But as human beings, human beings are, uh, you know, fallible people. And they are not supposed to be super Wonder Women or Supermen. But the point is that we have the will to do it. The will to do it. So Catalonia, the Catalan problem is not going to be finished with people who are in prison. I think the Catalan problem is going to be there for years. If not, I would say for decades. <laughs> Ya una pregunta que ha demanado hasta una estona. Ahora sí que va a ser la última, ¿eh? Y muy breve. Uh, I would not repeat myself, but I think the dialogue, I mean, uh, what you mean by dialogue is only dialogue among politicians. I don't believe only in dialogue among politicians. I believe in dialogue in civil society, among civic actors. Uh, civic actors sitting in Madrid and sitting in Catalonia or in Barcelona. So that's the, the most important dialogue which has to go on. Politicians, they never have dialogue, actually. They, you know, they have bargain. Uh, as you can see in the world today, even if they disagree, they make bargains together. Because they sit down and I say, okay, I'm not going to send my jets to bomb, bomb your nuclear uh, site, but you will give me this instead. Or you get rid of your proxy in uh, Lebanon. Uh, or you will do, uh, so they bargain, you know, they bargain like businessmen. Because businessmen, when they sit together, they only think in terms of their own interests, financial interests. Uh, otherwise, they will not be in businessmen. Okay? Uh, uh, the, the point that I'm making is about citizens sitting together and talking. That's why I talked about Socratic dialogue. You know, Socratic dialogue comes with no prejudice. When Socrates is dialoguing with the sophist in Plato's uh, dialogues, he has no prejudice against the sophist. Plato might have this prejudice, but Socrates doesn't have. He, he accepts the dialogue with Glaucon or with the Protagoras and with others. So can we sit down and talk with the non-politicians also? Meaning you can talk in, in, Bar in Catalonia, uh, independentists and unionists, can they go to a party and talk to have a dialogue? If they can have a dialogue without violence, it's, all, all, it's always a good start, you know? Because you can solve your problems this way. Or this is a good start to ask more questions about how you can change things, you know? This is how I think uh, Ireland and Scotland have changed. And I'm sure that practically in 10 years, 20 years from now, Scotland is going to be a separate country. And a free country as they want it because there is no way, and I, I wrote that in Ara also, there is no way that when people don't want something, we force them to have it. It's like a divorce. 
you know when one partner wants to leave marriage you cannot stop that person to stay you know because love is no more there you know and respect is no more there so you cannot whip your wife or your husband and say you have to be staying my with me I, it's no use because the most important thing is how we can once again why do we live together and how do we learn to live together so i think the problem of catalonia how what why do we want to live together how do we want to live together and to make a better society so thank you professor we thank you Every time that, that we talk about the Catalan case, there's a long debate afterwards, and, yes. uh, and I think it's positive. Uh, Seguim el missatge que ets positiu que ens ha transmès el professor Xavier Sant Bru, i com, com deia abans, avui tanquem la temporada de filosofia i ens tornem a trobar el proper. Gràcies. Gràcies. I read my books. <laughs>